the temple, the Bible says, listen, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. And what that symbolizes, we don't need a priest here anymore. I don't have to go to you. You don't have to go to me. When I'm in trouble, I know who to go to. When I need a touch, I know who to go to. When I need something that I can't get on my own, I know who to go to. The Bible says, come to the one who says I have the power, that I have the authority, that I can do all things through Christ. Hallelujah. That strengthens me this morning. If you believe it, will you shake your hands to heaven? The reason that the veil was torn is because Christ is now our high priest. He goes in and out of the presence of God. My God, is that not an incredible thought? That the one who is just like you and I, who came to be just like, he understands us. He's our representative in heaven. And Jamie's right this morning. Sometimes we look around and we think we're doing real good. We're feeling pretty good about ourselves. Pat herself on the back, say, oh, that's some good preaching. Oh, preacher, you did good. The Bible says none are good. This is the truth. No, not one. None. Only God. Only Him. But there is something good in you and me, though. <clears throat> Jesus. That's what's good in you. Look at me. That's the only thing that's good in you. Everything else is filthy and rotten and dirty. The rags. Johnny Cash, they said as he was dying, he was about to die. All the things that he ever accumulated in life. He had all this money, all these records, all this wealth, all these things, all these different kinds. He said they're nothing but dung. They're nothing but dirt. He called his empire an empire of dirt. Because he, he had met the king. He had met the one. Come on, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. He had met the one. The only one that can save us, look at me, the only one, the only one that can get us out of this mess that we're in. The third gift given to Jesus by the Magi was myrrh. Myrrh is the principal ingredient in the holy anointing oil in Exodus 30. It was used for embalming and also as a perfume. It also talks about how when the Roman soldiers tried to give Jesus wine, in chapter 15 of the book of Mark, said that wine mixed with myrrh, he wouldn't take it. It's an aromatic resin from a small spiny tree. That's where it comes from. And see, people don't know this, but if you think about it, he's, here he is, he's, he's the king, he's the priest, and right here he's the prophet. People say, well, how can he be the prophet? I said, they, 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 they use this. He, the people have preached that he was the suffering Messiah, that this was a type of his death and burial. And it was. That was one part of it. But it also represents Jesus and his anointed work as a prophet. And it, I said a minute ago, it symbolizes his death as myrrh was used in the spices at his burial that Nicodemus actually brought and the women and they put spices all over him. Listen. And I remember the time that Jesus was preaching. I feel this way sometimes. He was preaching in his own hometown amongst his own people. He was anointed. He was called there. God placed him there. And, and here he was. He opened up the book and began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Bible said when he got through preaching they didn't like what he had to say because he said this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing in your ear in your very ears in your very hearing in Matthew chapter 13 verse 57 it says and they were offended in him but Jesus said unto them a prophet is not without honor save in his own country and in his own house and it's true it is true but we do this not because of the people. That's part of it. But we do it because of God. Now I want to show you something. I've said all this to get to the final and most important part. This was something that the Lord showed me to encourage every one of you today. Look up here at this preacher. I'm about done. Give me five more minutes. The wise men... 
They teach us and they show us the secret and fulfillment to our lives by what they did. The first thing the Bible says is that they were wise men. And they were wise because they followed His star. Let's start there. Look up here at this preacher. They said he was wise. they were wise men because they followed His star. I could preach all day about the signs that are on earth that we're seeing. Just like this star. The signs of the ends, times, the signs of of, of trouble are upon the world or upon this earth. And you can see it everywhere just like this star shining brightly right in front of us, speaking to us. God said the first thing that He wanted me to tell the church that what you need to do right now, they said they followed this star. God said to tell the church, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Pick up your cross now and follow me. Don't follow me because it's convenient. Don't follow me when you want to. Don't follow me when it feels good. Follow me. Period. Follow hard after me. You better hear this preacher. We're coming to the end. We don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of the church are deceived. They don't hear the truth anymore. They live their life with reckless abandonment. And they put grace up as something that's going to save them. And they live their life ungodly, unholy, without God. And and still say it's all right because of grace. God said to tell you today to follow me. Follow hard after me. Secondly, the Bible says that they traveled a far distance from the east. A lot of theologians have debated whether they might have been the the sons of Keturah, Abraham's children. Others said they were astrologers and and kings from Persia. But my point is, is what they did is, is they traveled a far distance, which shows us this. God said to tell you, This shows the time they gave up for Him. Time. Let me read it again. This shows us the time they gave up for Him. See, people will come to church. They'll sit in the pew. And you should. If you love God, you shouldn't have any problem coming to the house of God. But that's only the only time they ever give Him. A lot of people. God said, I want you to tell the church... That this shows us today, the church, that we are to first of all to give up our lives. Give up our lives. There was a time back when I first got here, one night, that it was just, nobody would know the battle that, that our family was in. Nobody, not, not anybody knew. And I got, I was living in Knoxville. I got down here, man, it was just, I'd, I'd studied hard. Hardly anybody came to the service. Uh, my kids were having a hard time. They, you know, they were little. Jamie was, you know, was, was not in the best of moods that night because of the kids. And it was late, and I had to get up and go to work the next morning. And I pulled into Wendy's. I looked at the clock, and it said something about 9.23 or 9.24, and God quickened me to go to a scripture. And what the scripture said, I don't remember what gospel it is in now. I don't remember it. But, but he gave me the gospel and said, I want you to look at this scripture. It was on the clock. It was 9.24, and I was still almost an hour from home. God said to me through that scripture, He that saveth his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake shall gain it. And I want you to know that today, everybody in here. Every single one of you. It's not about a ministry or preaching or about your calling as part of it. It's about a relationship. God wants to have a relationship with you today. Listen to what I'm telling you. He said to tell you, church, He wants us to give up our lives. He wants our time. That's what He wants. People are looking for the answer. The answer is get in the presence of God. Spend time with Him. Amen. Come on, help me preach. Spend time in the presence of God. God says He wants our attention. You know how mad I get at my kids when they won't answer me? Oh my goodness. You get mad at your kids when they don't answer you? And they're not standing within an earshot of you and they ain't paying no attention? And they're doing everything else except what you want them to do. And if if, if they'll just listen to you for just a minute so you can get your attention, so you can tell them what they need to do, so you can lead them in the right way, or you listen to this, oh, the right way they need to go, so you can direct them and, 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 and so you can correct them, so you can help them. 
And that's the way we are. Every one of us. God says, I want you to tell them that I want your attention. And lastly, He wants your fellowship. I want to tell the story again. I was up at Greenback that particular night. I wasn't going to go. Jamie decided she had something. I think she had to work or something. So I took Gabriel to football practice. I've been up there a hundred times, probably more than a hundred times over the past so many years. And on the back side of the football field, on the other side, there's another field. And there on the field, there was a swing set. Big old long, obligated, long-gated looking thing. And of, of every time, I was telling Josh about it, of every time I've been there, he's never said a word, but today was going to be different. Now, I don't take pictures a lot on my cell phone. Very little. Jamie does, but I don't. I just don't I'm just not much of a picture guy. God said, get your cell phone out. He said, I want you to take a picture on that swing set. He said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, you what, Lord? He said, I want you to tell my church not to be deceived. Because there's a lot of people say, oh, I'm saved. Oh, yes, I was saved back in so-and-so time. Or, oh, yes, I go to church. Church, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the gospel. The deal about the swing set was it looked like a kind of like a teepee. It's one of them big longs that had the, the two things here and the long pole and the two here. But the, the thing that was wrong with the swing set is there wasn't any swings on it at all. There was nothing but an empty carcass of a swing set with no swings on it. And God said, this is what relationship is like without fellowship. My God, I, this is what it's like. This is how I see it. And he said, now I've shown you, now I want you to tell my people. Don't be deceived. Hear this preacher. Hear what I'm telling you. We've got to spend time with God in this hour. If there's ever been a time, if there's ever been a moment that I need to preach this message to you, God says, I want you to tell them that I want your attention and I want your fellowship. The Bible talks about that they gave out of their treasures. The Bible says when the wise men came, they gave out of their treasure, out of their substance, out of, out of the treasure that they had. God quickened me to this scripture in the gospel and it says, where your treasure is, there your heart, listen, will be also. The Bible says, listen, they came bearing gifts. They fell down and they began to worship Him. They fell down and they began to honor Him. They began to confess to Him. They fell down and said, You are King of kings and You are Lord of lords. The Scripture says that God has highly exalted Him. He has given Him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Chelsea, He is Lord. He is king. And God's still straight. And God is still narrow. God is still on the throne. He's not changed. The church has surely changed, but God's will and His Word has not changed. And then we see lastly the testimony. Listen. Because they acknowledged Him and they worshipped Him. And you know, when you're alive, there should be no problem with the testimony that's in your life. Jesus said Himself, well, He's talked about prophecy, but that's the top of the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He is, he is our testimony. Now, I want to go all the way back. I've got one more thing I want to show you. Here's the top of the devil. And I want everybody in here to hear what I have to say. If you've not heard anything else, hear this. Every one of us in our life somewhere when we're heading towards Christ, we're going to have to pass by the devil. Every one of us. Let me say that again. Every single one of us, every one of us, when you're heading towards Christ and you're on your way, He's going to try to meet you and stop you along the way, make you come back. That's what I'm going to show you. Herod said, come back. Once you found Him, come back. That's what He does now to the church. Come back. Come on, turn around, come back. Come on, look at this preacher. I'm telling it like it is from the heart of God. He's, he, he, he's going to meet you somewhere and try to get you to turn around and go back. And some of you have, but you can turn back around. The Bible says God warned them in a dream and God's warning this church today through His preachers, through His prophets, through His evangelists, through His teachers, through the men and women of God. God is speaking through His people today. 
And what is the main thing that God is 